My name is Carolyn Marshner and I am an Extension Associate working with the New York State Hemlock Initiative. Hemlocks are really important because they're what we call a foundation species. They create the environment that many other species need to survive and thrive. Hemlocks are very shade tolerant, they're an evergreen, and they are the third most common tree in New York State. So if we lose our hemlocks, we're going to lose a huge percentage of our trees in New York. Very often you can find hemlocks in a, the understory like this. They can stay suppressed in the understory for years until they get enough light to grow into the canopy. The needles of the, the eastern hemlock are too ranked, so they grow flat along the twig and they're very, very dark green. And then when you flip it over, the bicolored foliage, so you can actually see two white stripes that go down the underside of the needle. The cones are small, brown, and they have rounded scales, and they're under an inch in size. They grow in our gorges and ravines and generally near water. They have a shallow root system that actively holds in the soil on these steep, these steep river banks. One of the most important ecosystem benefits of hemlocks is the maintenance of cold water in our streams. They do this not only through direct shading of water, but also by retarding snow and ice melt over the landscape in the spring, which makes our streams the right temperature for brook trout and rainbow trout. This is a resource we can't afford to lose. Hi, my name is Christopher Williams. I'm with the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Saratoga County. I am the Invasive Species Coordinator for the Capital Region PRISM. And the word PRISM stands for a Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. Um, I work to oversee 11 counties. We have a contract with the New York State DEC in which we do anything and everything with invasive species from education and outreach and prevention all the way to management, early identification and controlling them. Today we're at Moreau State Park and we're going to do a little walkthrough. We're going to take a little look at some concerns that we have with an approaching hemlock woolly adelgid uh, bug that could potentially make its way up into this region. One of our concerns is the number of hemlock trees that we have in upstate New York. Uh, one of the plants in particular that is uh, invasive is this ornamental called wisteria. And this is a rather unique infestation that is in the park. As you can see that this vine has grown around these trees and it is actually girdling the tree. So it's rather aggressive and even at my feet down here, all of this is part of the wisteria. It's a colonial species, meaning that the roots grow outward and then there's new suckers that come up and it creates this infestation. And you can see that it's been active for quite a long time where some of the trees in this immediate area are girdled. Invasive species are non-native plants or animals, funguses, bacteria, or pathogens that are not from the region that we're currently in. And they have competitive advantages and they cause harm to the environment. They reduce the biodiversity of our ecosystems and sometimes can affect human health. So um, I want to thank you for inviting me here today, I'm glad we're uh, present together. Um, I want to take this opportunity from the warming hut to talk about hemlocks today um, and how they're a beautiful foundational tree that supports our ecosystems in the north part of our state. Um, and I also want to talk about a possible threat um, that's been present for some time in New York State and is making its way to the north called the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and I have on the screen today this little aphid-like uh, insect that is very difficult to see, um, but it has this really unique characteristic that it produces a waxy wool on the outside of its exoskeleton. Um, it uses that for warmth, and it also uses it for um, when it has its eggs, it deposits its eggs. And you can see from the screenshot here that we have a hemlock branch and all along at the base 
of the needles attached to the twig at the very base of the needles are, you see these little white waxy wool substances. And what you're looking at is the secretion that this insect uh, produces while it's feeding on the tree. And it's one of the easy ways to identify if there's hemlock woolly adelgid infesting a tree or not. Um, the good news in this park, as we know of today, there is no hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, but it's still a noble cause and we are looking for volunteers to go out and when they're on their woods walks or trail walks and they identify a hemlock tree and they take a look underneath the branches to see if they can find any of this adelgid. And if they should happen to find it, they can report it to our office or IMAP Invasives, which is an application or an app you can download to your phone or even call the New York State DEC. And since we're here in the Moreau Lake State Park today, you could also call the Office of Parks and Recreation and notify them. Um, the invasion wave is in Schenectady and southern Saratoga County. Um, I do believe in 2017 uh, there was an outbreak uh, at Prospect Mountain, which is in the Adirondacks, but that was treated by the state. Uh, it was only found in a very, very, very small population on three trees, and they took care of the problem. Again, going back to early identification, finding, knowing to look for these uh, species, and then uh, actually reporting them is key to taking care of our forests and keeping them healthy. Uh, so one of the other things I want to talk about today is actually how to identify a hemlock tree. And we'll actually go outside, we'll take a look um, at some of the properties, so when you're out that you don't mistakenly look at the wrong type of tree. So this particular outbreak of hemlock woolly delgate that we're looking at here in the photograph uh, was taken by the terrestrial coordinator of the PRISM. Her name is Nicole Campbell. And one of her surveying responsibilities that she does in the wintertime is she actually goes to where there are hemlock stands and she surveys them uh, throughout the work week. And when she finds them, she reports them. There's some things that you do when you look at these hemlock trees. Uh, to see if there's an infestation. For example, if you have a hemlock tree in your backyard, what you could possibly do. Or if you have a favorite park you like to go or preserve and you know there are hemlocks present, one of the things you can do is you look at the hemlock tree. And if it's a solo tree where it's been out in the open a little bit and it's receiving a healthy amount of sunlight and nutrients, the tree canopy, the hemlock itself, should look fairly healthy. You should see nice dark green needles, uh, new growth in the spring around May and June, you might have little lime green, t lime green tips. Um, really just healthy, robust looking tree. It's probably going to be in good shape. Um, but sometimes when you start to see a tree in decline, maybe the branches are thinning, uh, the needles are falling off on the ground, uh, the canopy of the tree is kind of weak, you can see through it, there's more sky exposed. Those are signs that the tree possibly could have some health issues and would warrant a closer look. So what we train our surveyors to do when we're working with them or when we partner with other members of park agencies or the DEC is we kind of look at the tree health at a quick glance and then use that as an assessment. If the branches are low to the ground, what we recommend doing is take a look at the branches in kind of like four different quadrants or within 360 degrees and just take the branch itself and flip it over and look at the underside. And later we'll go outside and I'll kind of point this out. Uh, and then you can just do a quick survey. And again, you're looking for the ovisacs, this white woolly mass, which is at the base of the needles along the twig. And this picture is a little bit remarkable because there's a lot of different uh, HWA wool sacs all over it. So it's really obvious. And sometimes you might only get two or three. Um, and one of the issues with the, this creature is that the adelgid lays eggs twice a year. And it produces asexually, it only needs a female, it lays between 50 to 100 eggs, and then those eggs hatch and they can lay 50 to 100 eggs in a second generation within one year. Um, so this is a tree that's been infested for some time. Now what happens when the adelgid is on the tree is that the hemlock knows that there's something wrong and it will send a response out to its branches and what the tree basically does, we use this term, I call, it, I call it compartmentalization. It knows that the adelgid's there, that it's removing some of the nutrients, it's 
through the fluids and the branches and it will actually shut off the flow of nutrients and fluids to the branch. In essence, it grows hard and it will actually self-trim or kill the branch. But the adelgid has the capability when it hatches, it goes through this little crawler season where it can crawl usually around April and May. And then as soon as it finds a fresh needle, it will insert its proboscis and start feeding, it goes into the summer, it estivates, and then it wakes up for the winter and does its damage. So sometimes when they're in this little crawler stage, they can fall from a branch to a branch higher up. If they're high up in the tree when it first starts, they can fall to a lower part of the branch and eventually the whole tree becomes infested. Um, the number one way in which the hemlock woolly adelgid, they believe, um, is transmitted from tree to tree is by birds. So when the eggs hatch and this little creature comes out, little crawler they call it, and its first instar, um, it can get on a bird's foot, it can get in their feathers, and then the bird can fly away, and then if there's enough time and it's just right and all the world lines up, that little bug will come off and land on a hemlock tree. It can then insert its stylus, and then it grows, and because they asexually reproduce, you now have a new infestation. So what we're looking at here is I have a close-up photograph of a hemlock twig and this is one of the needles of the hemlock. Later we'll talk about these white stripes used to identify a hemlock from underneath. But very closely you can see that there is an adelgid here. And it looks like a sesame seed. It's rather small. Again, this is magnified so normally this would be extremely hard to see. I find that you know younger kids, younger adults can find these with their eyes. But for us, it's a little bit difficult, so we use a hand lens to identify these creatures. And just on the outside, you can see the woolly secretion that it's starting to emit. Um, so this would probably be occurring in June or July or August. It's already gone through its life cycle of the crawler stage. It's now positioned where it's not going to move for the most of its life cycle. Once it's hatched, it only crawls a little bit, and then it finds the base of the needle here. It inserts that proboscis, this, this stylus, this long mouth part, and it kind of works its way through the twig, and then it just starts feeding, and that's basically its function. It's an aphid, and it's just gathering the nutrients from the tree. And again, the tree responds by blocking that part of the twig, and in its essence, the hemlock actually kills itself by compartmentalizing. Um, that one adelgid right there, it asexually reproduces, it can have again up to 50 to 100 eggs and then they will hatch in the spring and they'll crawl and go to a new part of the branch. Again, something like this, if you're surveying in the summertime and you're looking for that and it doesn't have the woolly mass, you would need like a little magnifying glass. Most people would recommend to just take a look in the winter time because it's really easy to spot with the woolly mass. So what you're looking at here is a trail map of Moreau State Park um, and it kind of gives you a nice overview. Um, here you have the main part of the park. This is up on Grant Mountain, higher elevation. You have Moreau Lake State Park here and the campgrounds. Um, so these are areas, what we call vectors, where humans come in. You have your little roads, your campsites, and when you bring your firewood in, if it's transported more than 50 miles, you might be bringing an invasive pest in. And the same with the hiking and you bring your pets in, we typically see in these highly used areas, we call them vectors or highly probable areas, where we tend to have more invasions introduced. Sometimes they're not as high threat, but this is likely where you're going to see the invasive species, and that's where the humans are. Moreau is unique because it actually has a low amount of invasive plants, and that's one of our missions is to try and protect this park. Since they're not here, our efforts for surveying, getting um, Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic uh, Preservation to go in and bring their staff in to remove, 
on invasive plants, identify them, getting citizen scientists involved in this community where we have this wonderful preserve or park um, and preserve its uh, ecological significance to preserve what it is today um, for the future as a, as a nice starting point. Um, you have the Hudson River that runs through here, um, the blue line of the Adirondack Park, and then to the north you have the foothills of the Adirondack. So we're basically at the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains here in northern Saratoga. We're going to go over here and take a look at a hemlock tree. Um, there's one on the road over here, there's some over by the lake mixed in with some white pines. And uh, I want to spend a moment and just kind of go over why hemlock trees are important as a foundational tree and how to identify them. So if you're looking for the adelgid, you hit the right tree and you're on the mark. So let's go over here by the road and take a look. So here along the road here on the edge of the lake, we have a couple of hemlock trees. And I want to talk for a brief moment about why hemlock trees are important. They are considered a foundational tree, meaning that there are insects that live in the trees, there are birds, there are wildlife, turkey, grouse, deer that will use them for shelter. Uh, there are a lot of songbirds that use them for nesting. Um, and they also play another important role is that they help to keep our waters, our rivers, and the edges of our lakes cool in the summertime. Uh, which allows for brook trout to survive better, which is a native New York fish. In addition to that, you can see that we have the snow underneath the uh, hemlock tree. And when we have hemlocks, they are a very shade tolerant tree. And they do not let a lot of sunlight penetrate to the ground. And what we tend to see is the snow will stay a little bit longer into the season, late into the spring, and it slowly releases the snowpack into the rivers and again also helping with the cooling of the water and shading it. So the hemlock tree is a foundational tree and it's rather important. So what I'd like to do for a moment is actually talk about how to identify a hemlock tree. So the first thing, it is an evergreen and you can see that we have one right here. When we look at the tree, I'm going to start with the needles first, is they tend to have these long drooping branches. The needles themselves are flat. And when you take a look at them, on the underside, if you flip the branch over, you notice the color change. There are two white stripes, and that's one of the easy identification pieces for a hemlock tree. Also, the needles, they're not very long. When I look at this, they're like between a quarter to three quarters of an inch. They're usually rather short. Um, so we have the hemlock needles. When we take a look at the bark, you can see some of the furrowing in the bark. They can tend to be a, a reddish gray or a brownish red color, and then the overall appearance of the tree. Um, I don't have any hemlock cones to grab here, but typically the cones will grow on the underside of the tree. They grow down, and they're about an inch in length, the female cones. Um, and that's another identification characteristic. And so if I were here and I wanted to survey for a delgit, I would simply take a branch I would flip it over, and in the winter time, I'm going to look for those white ovisacs. And so far, this would be called a non-detect. There is no HWA, no white woolly masses that we can find at the base of the needle. Not on the needles, at the base of the needle, on the twig where it inserts a stylus for feeding. Um, and so what I typically encourage people to do is they look at other parts of the tree and survey it. Now, one of the things about the adelgid is they're not always gonna find it on the bottom of the tree. The infestation, if a bird landed and brought it in, it could be in the top, it could be the middle of the tree. You might have one branch that has one or two ovisacs on it, or you could have a whole under side of the branch completely coated. And so what we encourage people to do is when they're out, to walk around and take a look. If I were to come upon a tree and I were to look at it and I know that's a hemlock and it has like a gray appearance and the needles seem to be dropping off and the, the canopy is rather thin, that's telling me again that that's probably a sick tree and I might want to take a closer look. And so, so far just looking briefly today we have these beautiful hemlocks here. This one's healthy. And hemlock trees when you're looking for them typically grow on the north side. They like cool conditions, kind of damp, moist ground, not saturated, but moist ground. They tend to be on the northern slopes. 
Uh, even when you're out kayaking, you can look for hemlocks and you'll find out that they kind of like the northern side, the shaded areas a little bit better when they're growing. So what you're looking at here, not related to hemlock woolly adulgate, but just some other tools for the trade for invasive species, um, boat launches, boat ramps, where you have public access points, you'll see these disposal stations and they encourage people to use these clean drain drive practices where they go through and inspect their equipment and remove any of the vegetation and they put it here to decay and become detritus. The idea is they don't have any hitchhikers on their kayaks, their motorboats, even their sups, their stand up paddle boards and then they take it to an uninfested water. So sometimes you'll see tools like this to encourage people to clean drain drive for the aquatic invasive species. So yeah, some of you might be asking like, well, what do I do? I, I know how to identify a hemlock tree. Um, I, I now know how to identify hemlock woolly adelgid. What are, what are some things I can do? And you can always contact, there's different people you can contact for help, uh, especially if you need like, you know, resource material or best management practices. Uh, again, you can go to our website, the Capital Region Prism, um, and you can look up information there. We do have our contacts at the bottom. Um, you can contact one of the coordinators for advice. You can email one of us. Uh, something else I'd like to talk about is IMAP invasives through the Natural Heritage Program. Um, there are some folks down in Albany at the central office that oversee IMAP invasives for New York State. They do a wonderful job. And this is actually um, an application that is used by natural resource managers and it can also be used by the average citizen. And it's a really unique tool in which we rely on people in the public, citizen scientists or the citizen scientists in the community at large to actually report invasives. And you can go to IMAP invasives. Uh, this happens to be the New York IMAP invasives. And if you don't have an account, you can simply click on create an account. Uh, it asks you to put in a basic password, your email, and then it allows you to use their services. In addition to that, you can also use IMAP invasives on your phone for reporting these invasive creatures. Um, the Hemlock Woolly Adelgit one, we have the app here, is rather unique that we also want to know if it's not there and they call them non-detects because if the trees are healthy it will put a point into the data program and it will let us know that hey there's a hemlock stand there and it's healthy if there's an infestation down the road there's a slight timeline so you can just download the app through Android or Google and then you log in from your account here and you simply can just add an observation it lets you take a picture of it and so if you have an infestation or an invasive species, you take a picture, you use the photo, and then what you can do is you can select the name of the species, you put the species name in, in this case I'm just going to not put anything, maybe a tester, and then you can also have a few other notes. It shows your location, it's GPS based, so you don't have to have Wi-Fi. And then you can put a couple notes in. I was at Moreau Lake State Park, we didn't find any Hemlock Woolly Adelgit. You can then save it. You can then press the OK button. And then once you're done, you just simply go to the menu bar and you can upload your report. And what will happen is that will actually go into the IMAP database as a point showing us where the invasives are. Adopt a park, adopt a preserve. Maybe it's your backyard and start identifying these invasives, start reporting them. Use the tools that IMAP invasives, contact our office and let us know. But again, I think it's really important on a small scale as you know, a citizen scientist, you can take care of things even if it's in your backyard or on a larger scale adopting a park and just actually learning what the common invasives are and in, in updating your content and your knowledge and going out in, in places that you love to be in and enjoy. And if you want to preserve uh, these beautiful 
natural environments that might be aesthetically pleasing or maybe they house um, a forest community of creatures and plants that are rare and endangered to actually be vigilant and actually report. So identify and report and adopt a park and make it your own. Thank you. Uh, one other thing, because I forgot, and that's probably really important too. Uh, New York State Hemlock Initiative through Cornell University. Um, the folks down in Cornell are doing a wonderful job and you can go online and look up their website, but they actually have a bug lab where they are investing time and energy in producing biocontrols that are um, specific in targeting and eating the hemlock woolly delgit. They also have a really, really, really well done video if you want more information on hemlocks and the hemlock woolly delgit. I recommend going to their site cruising through it, find the video, watch a video, and learn more about science, because it's cool. Thank you. Well, welcome back. I'm still trying to bake the muffins. But finally, finally, I think we're finished. I hope you enjoyed our show today. If you would like to make an order or donate muffins to charity, then please go to the website listed below. With every muffin order, we donate muffins to the charity of your choice. <laughs> I call it giving your dough to charity. I also encourage you to donate directly to the featured charity today by going directly to our website and getting their information. Thank you very much for watching and keep on dancing through life by giving to others through love. Let me finish baking these muffins and see you next time.